Hello everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to Mondays with Mr. Happy, aka Mr. Happy Mondays, the weekly Q&A show where you ask me questions and I answer them. Real quick, videos at the bottom. I have a lot of Final Fantasy 15 videos that I did, I have a lot more planned, plus all the DLCs and supports. We're going to be doing lots of videos about Final Fantasy 15, I have a feeling, for the next six months to a year, depending on, uh, depending on how the content ends up panning out. My review is also down there, so be sure to check that out. Now, uh, unlike last week, I am rec recording this live on Twitch again, so we're going to go back to doing it the way that we've, we normally do it, or we have been normally doing it. Last week, I wasn't feeling well, didn't stream, or I'm sorry, I didn't even think about how much time I was spending on the stream on Final Fantasy XV, so I didn't get to record the Monday video until the next day, so it was kind of all screwed up. We get to do it on Sunday, I get to answer the questions on the forums, I get to answer the questions live, and then everything will be good to go. On that note, let's get into the questions over on the Dream Network forums. All right, first question. Hey, how's it hanging, Mr. Smiley Face? My name's not Mr. Smiley Face, it's Mr. Happy. You got it wrong. How, it's an easy name. How'd you get that wrong? I'm not new, although it's been a long time since I asked the question. Uh, here's a super special bonus paper clip, a rubber band, and some pocket lint. I could do an AP power leveling method with Final Fantasy XV with the rubber band. Anyway, here is my question. Circumstances in my life recently changed, and for the first time since the Realm Reborn launched, I have felt more comfortable with my schedule to try it as static, especially since this raid here is more accessible than the previous two. So I joined a group, and I don't really like it. Part of it has to do with the group itself. Every week, it seems one or more people are running late, and people are trying to fill in for roles they aren't very good at, mostly are healers. I was find that raiding three hours a day, three days a week is just tiring, possibly because our group isn't running very well. Plus, on weeks where we didn't raid like Thanksgiving, I was able to clear a 9 and 10 Savage in the Party Finder group, and this last week I did some the same with A11 Savage, which my raid group has been having major trouble with. Point, I'm seriously considering just giving up on statics at least for now. I'd like to clear A12 Savage at some point, but sticking with my current group, it feels like that's a long way off. I told my group that I'm taking this week off to focus on finals, but now I'm wondering if I should just back out entirely and do things like... Dude, honestly, if you're beating it in the Party Finder, and you're having better success in the Party Finder than with this group... At this point, you might as well try A12 Savage in the Party Finder, because <laughs> it sounds like you're you're well on your way to getting a full clear through that way. Yeah, it doesn't sound like you're happy. It doesn't sound like your ideals of acceptable gameplay matches their ideals of what's acceptable gameplay, and that leads to slower progression. That leads to that leads to people disagreeing and poor attitudes and poor communication. And it just if you don't have eight like-minded individuals, there's always going to be something that's like really really off that just never gets. Uh, fixed in the group and the group just is never satisfying to at least one person it seems like you are probably that one person who it is least satisfying to so it's probably easy to just let them off tell them that you know it's not exactly what you thought it would be um and that you th you'd like to pursue other opportunities um and yeah i mean it sounds like you're just better off doing that than forcing yourself to stick it out with a group that you're clearly not happy with that would be my advice all right, next question. A Hap. Thanks for answering my question last week about overleveling the story of 15 last week. So I have a shiny Pokemon. You said last week twice. That was really confusing to me. I have a shiny Pokemon of your choice. Eh, whichever one works. My question is the following. I caught your stream last week when you were going through the Pityos dungeon. It seemed to be quite the memorable dungeon. What are your most memorable dungeons in gaming and why? What is your most memorable dungeon? I don't think I have one most memorable dungeon. <laughs> Like, I could think back to, like, the Ice Cave of Final Fantasy 1. I could think back to the Volcano of Final Fantasy 3. I could think back to the Fire Ship and the Final Dungeon of Final Fantasy 5. I could think to the Crystal Tower of Final Fantasy 3. I could think Kefka's Tower in Final Fantasy 6. I could think of the North Crater of 7. I could think of, um, uh, what's... 8? I do have a favorite dungeon in 8. I can't remember which one, what what the name of it. The, the Underwater Research Facility in 8. I could think back to Ibsen's in Final Fantasy 9. I could think back to Final Fantasy 10. I don't have any favorite dungeons. The dungeons in 10 are kind of lame. The Omega Dungeon, there's nothing really special about it. Um, like, I have favorite dungeons in all the different games, so I don't think I have a single most memorable one, but I'll tell you this. My most memorable dungeons are usually the dungeons that frustrate me the most. Like, Ice Cave in Final Fantasy 1 is, like, one that pops out a lot, because I had a I, every time I play through that game, I hate the Ice Cave, but I love to hate it. It's an experience, and it's something that is memorable to a lot of people, and that's really a thing with, with RPG dungeons. You don't remember the super easy, blaze through it dungeons. You always remember the ones that fucked you in the ass as hard as possible. Ice Cave is that dungeon for me. So, Ice Cave, I'm going to go with that one. If I have to pick one, I'm going to go with the Ice Cave, because it's like right in the first Final Fantasy. It's bullshit. And I have a hilarious time going through there every single time. All right, next question. Hup, Mr. Sappy. Wait, I hwap my H -th and my F. -th. I don't even know how I pronounce that. Okay, back to the regularly scheduled question. I have 
asked questions before, so here is a returning inqu inquiry bonus, inquirer bonus of a perfect Wonders Tales positioning until the expansion. Basically, you always get three line rewards as long as you do your WTs. I have not been doing my WTs, but thank you. Anyways, kind of a miscellaneous technical, technically question. Uh, when you have a spoiler question, how would you get around dealing with someone who knows how to read lips? They can mute audio all day, but they still have to watch the video to know when the spoiler discussion is over. I cannot read lips, by the way, I just imagined. Here's, here's what I'm going to say. If at this point, you, if, if you are deaf and watching my videos, thank you. If you can read lips, holy shit, I'm impressed. And I have nothing I can do to help you. I'm not going to do this every time I want to do a question so they can't read my lips, you know what I mean? This is basically the only way I'm going to get around. And now I'm ruining the video for people who are deaf who might be trying to read my lips right now because they can't... And they know I'm fucking with them, too, because it's... It's not going anywhere, you know what I mean? That's the only way you could really do it, and I'm not going to cover my mouth for... <laughs> for the spoiler questions or just or I could just like I could just do this and be like well now you can't read my lips there's the fucking picture of a rock and uh that's that's the end of it that is my solution is a uh, Dwayne all right next question hi Mr. Happy first time question welcome how do you feel about Hildebrand in 3.0 I really enjoyed Hilde in 2.x but find the series lackluster in 3.x would you like to see him return in 4.x so 2.0, they had planned Hildebrand ahead of time. 3.0, he came back due to popular demand, so he wasn't planned out as well. I think that the quality of the 3.4 Hildebrand quests, if that was maintained the entire time, I wouldn't have minded. But 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 Hildebrand was pretty disappointing. It was, it had its moments that were funny, but it wasn't really anything that good. I would only like to see Hildebrand at 4.0 if we can either maintain the comedic qualities of 3.4 or we can go back to the formula we had in 2.x where we got to use him sort of as a bridge to fight older Final Fantasy characters. Alright, next question. Hello, Mr. Happy. I have one gaming question and one non-gaming question related to this week. One, do you think there will be a Final Fantasy 16? And if you do, will it be for the PS4? So, yes, I do think there will be a Final Fantasy 16, though not for at least another five to six years minimum. Most people are going to joke around and say 20 years. There was rumors that Agni's philosophy ended up, that character ended up being moved into the production of Final Fantasy 16, but that's such a rumor that like it was mentioned at one point and then like nothing. So I'm not confident that it's actively being worked on. I don't think it is. Um, and if it will be for the PS4, I mean in five or six years is the PS4 still going to be like the console? Like that's my question. If the PS4 isn't, I don't know if the PS4 will still be the main PlayStation console five or six years from now. You know what I mean? I'm not 100% confident in that. Uh, and two, what is the number one foreign country you want to visit the most? So this is tough. Um, Japan's a big one for me. Um, and then the other one is somewhere, anywhere in Europe, really. I would like to visit Europe at some point. I don't have anything in mind. I would like to go to either the Europe or the, oh, the Europe. I'd either like to go to Europe or the United Kingdoms. Um, just somewhere there, like London, or something would be would be really nice, I feel. And yes, I am deliberately separating Europe from the United Kingdoms. I'm just uh I'm just ahead of the game, I suppose. <laughs> so yeah, either Japan or, or like London. All right, next question. Hey, Haps, I kind of paused Final Fantasy 15 a bit, and I'll return to it for sure. It's the best Final Fantasy game on current consoles. It's like one of the only Final Fantasy games on current consoles. But I have a question regarding the recurring behavior in the online gaming community. I'm currently in a writing frenzy, so off-screen reading would be appreciated. So I actually read this way ahead of time, like six hours ago, so I know what it involves. Um, for anybody who wants to know what this says, basically, since he's asking for me to hide it, I'll paraphrase. Um, it's describing how um, content in Final Fantasy XIV, its uh, enjoyability is kind of brought down by people always being so competitive over DPS numbers. So the question itself is TLDR would would be competitive gaming, would competitive gaming be more accessible if there were less annoyances? So this question to me makes no sense. I'll just say it. Less annoyances is like, what are annoyances? The whole point of competitive gaming is to be competitive. Also, DPS numbers in MMOs are not competitive gaming. Competitive gaming is like League of Legends, Dota, Smite, Paladins, Heroes of the Storm, Starcraft, sort of now. <laughs> Sorry, Starcraft. <laughs> It's been on the decline, so I had to hit it pretty hard with that one. Um, so I don't understand what that means. That's, that is my answer to this question. I don't understand what that means, what that question means at all. 
I think you need to calm down and word your question because apparently what's in this little spoiler tag has you so upset to the point where I actually... It's a joke? Wait, I, I'm confused. Is what a joke? I'm confused. Or oh, no, no, no. You guys are talking about something in the chat. I thought you were talking about this question right here. Um, this question doesn't make any sense. So I think you need to go back to the drawing board and like figure out what you actually want to ask because I don't think that this is an actual question, if that makes sense. All right, next question. Greetings, Mr. Happy. I hope you're having a fantastic day. It's been a good one. It's been a swell day for certain. I have a couple of questions about Scholar. I'm so not qualified to, to answer these questions, but I'll do my best. My first question is pet choice. I hear that Selene is optimal, but the 3% attack speed buff seems so weak compared to the amount of healing Aos provides, especially in formats. Aos keeps your cleric longer. Wouldn't that be more damage overall? So in general, Eos doesn't keep you out of cleric that much longer. Although I do know a lot of people just go Eos just because they don't feel like micromanaging Selene in any sense of the way. Um, it depends, really. In four mans, there shouldn't be so much healing to the point where Eos is making that big of a difference. Like, it's still ultimately embrace the tank, embrace the tank, embrace the tank. And the second you kind of step back to have Selene or have Eos cast, like, Whispering Dawn... You kind of lose that. The magic defense buff doesn't really do a whole lot unless you're fighting a very specific type of enemy. So it comes down to the healing one. And the healing one is only going to be infecting, whisp affecting Whispering Dawn and Embrace or your heals. So I don't... Eos doesn't really make that big of a difference to keep you in Cleric longer. It's more about making sure that you micromanage the use of cooldowns. You know, making sure you're using eye for an eye. Making sure that you understand how many auto attacks the tank can take, how many embraces Selene can maintain, making sure you're using your pet buffing abilities to pump out more healing from just Selene as opposed to just Eos. So honestly, since they changed Selene to the attack speed, it doesn't matter. Also in four mans, generally, it's not that big a deal. Who cares? Like you play your preference when it comes to uh, most jobs in the in the duty finder anyway. It's just It's so irrelevant because it's not difficult content. So... You should be fine with Selene. Eos's extra healing shouldn't be making so big of a difference that it keeps you in Cleric longer. It just, it shouldn't. It shouldn't add up to that much over the course of how either bursty or non-bursty uh, healing actually is in four-man content. As for the second question, since Square has mentioned moving away from stances and reducing button bloat, do you think they'd consider removing Cleric stance making healer damage scale with mind? I do actually think that is something that they will consider or that they are considering. I don't know if it's something they will ultimately do, but I know that cleric locking is a big problem when it comes to a lot of healers. Even the most skilled healers have cleric locking issues, so I wouldn't be surprised to see that be something that is removed later on. All right, next question. Hello, Mr. Happy. This is Final Sim, and welcome to my question on your channel. I've heard the recently the term best in slot. Can you explain in detail what that means? It means it's the best gear for your job, the highest the highest DPS output in terms of tanks, it's usually combined with survivability, um, but it's still almost always what yields the highest damage output for your job. Uh, can you tell me what's best for Paladin? No, I can't, because I don't know Paladin gear. All I can tell you is that meet the minimum accuracy requirement for a fight and then crit and determination. That's it. As long as you can meet the accuracy requirement, get all the crit debt you can get, and you'll be fine. Fuck parry, fuck skill speed, get as much crit debt as you can. All right, next question. Hey, Hap, have some mince pies. Thank you. I guess. Uh, just one question, but it's an interesting one. What is the most important thing for making a game feel like Final Fantasy? For me, there's there's two things that you need. You need what are known as recurring themes and to be an RPG. <laughs> like, that's really all it needs. It doesn't matter if it's turn-based action, doesn't matter. An RPG, a role-playing game, and that kind of experience that I can go into with the game. You know, different stats, items, you know, loot, whatever. You know, things that make up RPGs in general. You also have the recurring themes, chocobos, the crystal theme, moogles, you know, edgy main characters that use swords and hate the world. You know, the, the normal things that come with, with Final Fantasy games. Um, sometimes it's world's map, sometimes that's story, you know, uh, you know, focused storytelling, side quests, you know. Really all that defines Final Fantasy, you could literally, of all the Final Fantasy games, not even named Final Fantasy. And they would all still be the same game. Nothing changes. So maybe Square Enix has a recurring theme. Well, Square Enix likes to put these things called chocobos in all their games. Fantastic. You know what? We use that to define Final Fantasy now. If all the Final Fantasies weren't even called Final Fantasies, Square Enix could still do that. It would just be like a Square Enix thing. Other companies do that all the time where they have like recurring themes in their games, even if their games are completely unrelated. So 
those are the things that define it, but I don't feel like they're so restrictive that we can't see them in other games as well coming out of Square Enix. So that's why I'm very open to what Final Fantasy is. Final Fantasy is ultimately a Square Enix RPG product with a few recurring themes. Crystals, chocobos, moogles, things like that, job systems, whatever. Whatever that is, I usually am pretty accepting of or pretty open to what they want to call Final Fantasy. All right, next question. Hey, Mr. Happy, I have two quick 15 questions for you. Most important, first one. Okay, I, I, may, I read both the questions really fast as I slowed down there to make sure there's no spoilers here. There's not. Um, most important one first. Luna, Iris, Sydney, or Aranea? Aranea, easy choice. Second one, what level do you recommend I be before pursuing super bosses? I finished the story at level 53 and going after super bosses in dungeons. Um, really 80-ish, and you don't even need to be that level. You could be lower level if you have items, if you have patience, if you have very well-crafted spells that can just decimate enemies. You don't even need to be that. But anywhere between 80 and 99, I guess, is just a level I could recommend, like an arbitrary level I could recommend, but by no means are those levels mandatory. Next question, A hey, Happy, first time posting here. I've had to miss out on a ton of your streams due to bad internet, but now that's sorted, I can finally return. I hope that'll be a good enough bonus. It is... Thank you. Anyway, question time. One, so I finished my Summoner 240 Relic and I put all my points into crit debt. I was told by a free company member I should have went crit uh, spell speed. We actually just had this, this discussion on my stream earlier. The stat weights for Summoner have indeed changed to the point where spell speed is 0 .003 per point more effective. So 0.3% more effective per point than uh, determination is now, but only up to, I believe, a value of 750. As soon as you exceed 750 spell speed, that value diminishes. So this is a, this is new information in the last, I think, three weeks or so, this, this information has become prevalent. Um, so, you know, it's 0.3% per point. Like it doesn't make or break, but you are gonna have people questioning that decision now that the new stat weights have come out. And if somebody asks you, go, oh, well, I did these when we didn't know that the spell speed stat weights and I don't feel like changing it. It's who the fuck cares? Especially because you say right here, uh, you're not doing Savage this time around. So you, uh, I decided at the beginning of the patch to not do Savage this time around. So if I did mess up my stat allocation, is it worth reallocating them? No, because the fucking expansion's coming out. Who gives a shit? Like, so you'd be like, oh, is that, well, it's, you know, you just explain like, well, when I did this, the stat, you know, the stat weights that the community knew were different. And I don't feel like going through all the work of, no, don't get me wrong, getting sands is, and this is going to be the rebuttal that they give you, by the way. Getting the sands is really easy to do it because you just need the sands. You don't need the umbrites. Um, but people are, you know, it's like, who gives a shit? By the time it matters, the expansion's out. Who cares? Right? That's, a, that's my opinion at the very least. Um, two, favorite condiments. So glad you said condiments and not condoms. Condiments, um, horseradish sauce is a big one for me. Um, steak sauce was bigger for me when I was young. I don't do it as much anymore because I just, I eat higher quality meat now, phrasing. Um, so yeah, horseradish sauce, mustard, um, barbecue sauce. I'd say those are my top three condiments. As for food condiment combinations, sweet potato fries and horseradish sauce. Oh, I just want, I want it now, okay? Um, mustard, I'll do mustard with like hot dogs or pretzels or things like that nowadays. And then barbecue sauce, everything else other than steak, pretty much. I'll put it on burgers, I'll eat it with my french fries, I'll eat it with the sweet potato fries. I don't give a shit, I'll put barbecue sauce with anything. Anything. I fucking love barbecue sauce. Alright, next question. Hey Haps, has anyone calculated the exact odds of getting three lines? I believe there's a 0.2% chance of getting a perfect three lines starting from zero stickers and going directly to nine stickers. Even if you say you get an, now when you say you get an average of three shuffles per, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when you shuffle. All that matters is how many stickers are on the board, what are my odds of getting to it from this point? So like for example, let's say you have seven stickers and you shuffle and you get two lines, right? Now you've met a specific percentage. You have, you know, you have, let's see, that means you have seven, that means you have nine slots remaining and you need two of those nine slots, specifically two specific ones, in order to get your three lines. So it matters from that point, from seven to nine, what are your odds? From zero to nine, what are your odds? From three stickers to nine, what are your odds? So yeah, people have calculated all those different odds. I only know that the base percentage of like from zero to nine is like 0.2% of getting the three line difficulties. Um, so yeah, that, those numbers are out there though for all the different stickers, they're on Reddit somewhere. By the way, I've been enjoying the addition of Chloe's books. It gives me a reason to do extreme primals. Primals are fun and challenging, but the reward wasn't worth the time investment, unless you get mounts, which I've gotten a few of since doing this. So I'm grateful for that one. 
All right, next question. Sup, bruh? Probably a hard question. Now that you have played all Final Fantasies recently, could you rank the stories from the least interesting to most interesting in a personal top 16? So not taking into account the gameplay or graphics, etc. I was just, I, uh, just how intriguing or interesting the stories were to you. The 16 competitors are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, 2, 12, 13, 13, 2, Lightning Returns, 15. All right, so let's, this is, this actually isn't as hard. So one, two, and three have like virtually unimportant stories. They're super generic. There's nothing interesting about them. There's no emotional tie to any of the characters. They're basic bitch generic RPG stories. So those are lower on the list. Four, five, and six have actual storytelling. Four is actually very reminiscent to 15 storytelling, where four gives you a lot of characters, it puts them in a scenario for you, but it doesn't give you much history of the majority of the characters. It gives you the bare minimum you need to get to the end of the journey. But four is still has a more cohesive storytelling than a fair portion of the other ones. Five, same deal, also has, uh, five has some very emotional moments as well. Uh, especially the way that you switch from Galuf to uh, Kryl in terms of party members. Six, six also reminds me a lot of 15 in the sense that there's a story, you get all the information you need, but you don't get all of it unless you go out of your way to get it. Like unless you start going travel to every location with the right party members to get all the backstories, if you don't do that, you miss out on hours and hours of backstory for all the different characters in your group. And there's also characters you may never actually get in your group unless you go out of the way to get them. So again, it's quite disjointed Final Fantasy VI's story, but the one main story that's being told um, is is good. So that one's a little bit, it's ranked a little bit higher for me. Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII is almost like the baseline for like what a Final Fantasy story should have. Some emotional moments, um, a, a good villain, um, good introduction to all the characters. It gives all of the characters sort of like their own chapter of the story. You learn a little bit more about Barrett. You learn a little bit more about Red 13. And it has that for everyone. Plus, it has a couple of optional characters that have their own backstories that you can dive into. So all the information is in the game. Whether or not you actually access it is up to you. But a lot of it is streamlined for you. So you know a little bit more about these characters. So you care a little bit more about these characters. Final Fantasy VIII, very much the same. And because there's no optional characters, it's almost done a little bit better than Final Fantasy VII. The problem that Final Fantasy VII, VIII, IX, and a lot of the Final Fantasies from this point on is they get a little bit too crazy for their own good. Like Seven starts as you could follow it pretty well, and as they introduce all these things involving like you know Zack and everything that's sort of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII comes to cover, you start finding a lot of plot holes and and problems in the story that they want to fix with Seven Remake, for example. Final Fantasy VIII has that same problem as well, although it all wraps up into a pretty nice gift, something you can at least understand and you enjoyed it. There's so many unanswered questions across like the later Final Fantasy games. Final Fantasy IX, um, I don't like Final Fantasy IX's story very much. I like Kuja as a villain, but none of the other characters seem interesting to me other than Vivi. I don't like Steiner, his story that's told, although it's funny occasionally, it's not very interesting. Zidane as a villain, he's a little bit too uppity for me. The whole Eidolons and Summons thing, it's just like glanced over. They basically introduced to you that these things existed and that they played a role at some point, but they just completely glance over how important Eidolons and Summons are in that game. Um, and outside of, a, outside of it being like the main goal of one of the villains, pretty much. Uh, it feels like they've really kind of, they just left a whole huge piece of that ancestry out of the story after explaining to you that it was there. Um, also, I just, again, the way it ends, Final Fantasy IX's ending, yeah. Final Fantasy X has a pretty well put together story, it, again, a lot like with Final Fantasy VII and VIII, where it gives all the characters sort of their own piece of the story to, for you to explore. Uh, it's very, very good for the storytelling experience, it makes you care about all the characters, and there's a lot of optional dialogue there as well. Um, Final Fantasy XII is a mess because of Vaughn and Pinello. They're just, they start off, the first two hours of Final Fantasy XII, Vaughn and Pinello are set up to be characters that will be super important, and they have meaningful character progression. And as soon as they introduce all of the six characters, Vaughn and Pinello are just, they're second thoughts. Like, they, there's, there's more cutscenes where they tell Vaughn to shut up than there are cutscenes where Vaughn says something that's useful pretty much for after the first two hours of the game. So Final Fantasy XII, and also the Final Fantasy XII story is very different from the rest of the Final Fantasy stories. So if you're into the whole like empire versus rebel thing going on there, like Star Wars, then it's a little more interesting. 
Um, 13 story, outside of the whole Le Cee Falsy thing being so poorly explained that I could give two less shits about it in the entire game, other than the fact they just keep spewing these random fucking words at me, it does do a lot of the things that the, final, that the later Final Fantasy games did right in terms of character progression. Meaningful character progression, especially when they start splitting you up into groups of two. You get to learn a lot more about the characters. Even if you don't like Hope, his character does progress, it's just not till way later in the story and he's just annoyed the shit out of you at that point. 13-2 focuses on three main characters, which gives it a little bit more of an advantage while still giving you a piece of the story for all the characters that you may remember from the first game. Lightning Returns, let's pretend that game doesn't have a fucking story because it's awful. Story, every aspect of the story in Lightning Returns is awful. There's no, there's little to no character development for the main character. There's only one main character. And the little bit of character development you get is basically just a bunch of people bitching and moaning the end of the world is coming. So it, it has almost no bearing on the ultimate end of the game. And then 15 has, I kind of mentioned it with 4 and 6, it tells you Noctis' story and everything Noctis knows or needs to know for his journey. Everything that will get him to the end of his journey. It leaves out a lot of world building, where unless you go out of your way to use like Brotherhood and Kingsglaive and listening to a lot of the NPC dialogue and reading all the things that are like scattered on the ground or in newspapers in the game, there's a lot missing there. A lot of it's left up to user interpretation for the world building, and that's why they're patching in stuff. So I'll say that the main story is done in a very Final Fantasy-esque style, um, but they left out too much of the world building with the side characters. So if I had to rate them, 1, 2, and 3 are on the lower end. 4, 5, and 6 are on the higher end. 7 is my baseline, so that's like dead center for me. 8 is slightly above 7. 9 is slightly below 7. 10 is like in the top 3. 10-2, I forgot it was even on the list because I like to pretend it doesn't exist. That one's going straight to the fucking bottom of the barrel. Uh, Final Fantasy XII, also on the lower end. I'm not a fan of the character development and the story that's being told. Uh, Final Fantasy XIII, actually on the higher end. Um, just too many terms that are just thrown at you without much explanation. That's the biggest problem Thirteen has. Thirteen two also kind of just below Thirteen on the upper end. It's a more interesting story, um, and now at this point you already are used to a lot of the terms that you heard in the original Thirteen. A villain that I very much enjoy is Caius, so... Uh, 13 2 just sits just below 13 on the upper end. Lightning Returns, throw that right down at the bottom with 10 2. And 15 is also on the upper end for me. I just wish it had done more world building. I prefer Final Fantasy 4, 5, 6, and 10 story over 15, but I prefer 15 over so many more, uh, so many other ones of the series. Um, and I gave you all the extra information. Hopefully, all that explanation made a lot of sense to anybody who was listening to that right there, because that's where I kind of place everything in those stories for the Final Fantasy series. And I think this is the last question that's actually on the Dream Network forums, and we can move over to some Twitch questions. Uh, hello, Mr. Happy. First time asker, long time lurker, have a bonus whatever you want, bro. I've heard you talk about jump potions, wondering if they do get added, what tools do you think they would give new players to learn their jobs? We've discussed this pretty much in detail, so I'm not going to go into too much. An intermediate hall that actually explains your jobs, uh, individual mechanics. The first job that you jump with, it's actual mechanics, how certain abilities work together, how you're expected to play it. An intermediate hall, similar to Hall of the Novice, that is more focused on individual jobs. Hell, I would even make that something that you, not just for jump potion users, but for general users as well, but it'd be something that you'd be forced to make the jump potion users go through, as well as the Hall of the Novice. Um, would you be against a Matt fight like an 11 where players couldn't progress to the new level cap? Now, that, see, Matt was really weird, because you didn't actually need to know how to play your job against Matt, you just needed to know how to destroy one target as fast as possible. They didn't actually teach you anything. It taught you more if you were like a red mage who had to do it um, than it did if you were like a samurai or a dark knight. Like, well, I just pop all my fucking abilities and hope he doesn't use a certain fist fucking eight times in a row. Because if he did that, it didn't matter how good you were at your job. He was going to shit all over you if he did a certain fist back to back to back. Thief, you just had to steal an item from him. Oh yeah, that explains how Thief is supposed to be played. Please. And then White Mage, heal yourself. That's more explanatory, but again, it still comes down to, does he just spam a certain fists and interrupt you and shit? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. It's fucking RNG whether or not you actually get through that fight sometimes, so... No, I'm not a big fan of the map fight from Eleven. It's just, it's not an actual test of skill. It's a test of, can you get past this one dude so you can level more? It has no bearing on if you're actually skilled at the game or not. All right, and that's all the questions over here on the Dream Network forum. So at this point, what we do is we open up the floor. We do some live questions here in the Twitch chat before we wrap things up. So Twitch chat, hit me with your questions.
All right, so my first question coming from the Twitch chat is which MMMO are you looking forward to more? Now, I originally misinterpreted that as, what do you mean which MMO? It means mobile massively multiplayer online, Final Fantasy XI or Final Fantasy XV. For those who didn't know, Final Fantasy XI is being remade for an international release on mobile devices, and it will be an MMO on your phone or on your iPad or whatever. And Final Fantasy XV is getting the same treatment. They're going to expand on the world of EOS in an MMO setting in a mobile MMO, similar to the Final Fantasy XI remake. I'm looking forward more to Final Fantasy XV because I have more questions about it. Final Fantasy XI remake, I already know the story. I already know the jobs. I already know kind of where they're going. And it's a mobile game, so I have kind of expectations that there's going to be a stamina system involved or something along those lines. You know, it's got to make money, ultimately. Uh, Final Fantasy XV is a little bit more confusing because the way the story begins and ends, I don't know that it leaves much up to interpretation. So I'm curious to see how that even develops into its own MMO with its own story, etc., etc. So I'm definitely more interested in Final Fantasy XV's MMO uh, tropes, or MMMO tropes, than I am with Final Fantasy XI, because I've been there, done that with Final Fantasy XI, even though I know it'll be different. I've still been there, done that, so it's not as interesting to me. All right, so the next question I have is more of a personal one. Mr. Happy, what is your favorite holiday memory to date so far in your life? So this is my favorite one, and I've told this one before, but I love talking about it because it's hilarious. So when I was five years old, and I'm sorry for those of you who are way older than me, but I'm about to date myself here. I'm like, it's a surprise. I'm 25 years old. Fuck you. I'm 25 years old. Fuck you. Anyway, I, when I was five years old, I got a Nintendo 64 as a Christmas present. Now, my birthday and Christmas are two days apart, so that's, you know, normally that it's a combined gift thing, but I actually like that because it meant that I got a more expensive gift on Christmas, didn't have to wait two days, and bam, it's it, I used it to my advantage. But So I opened the N64, or I opened the thing, and it's an N64 box, and I don't turn it into N64 kit, but I'm like, yeah, awesome, I got an N64 just like I asked for it. Thank you, Mom and Dad. Then... I go looking under the tree for the next gift to open, and I'm looking for something that resembles an N64 game. So I start shaking gifts because I don't really know what the boxes are like, what they look like. And I finally get to one that sounds like it's a video game, and it is. It ends up being Super Mario 64. First N64 game. I think that's most people's first N64 game. And I open it, and I look at my mom and my dad, and I say, thank you. I This is exactly the game that I wanted. And then my mother looks at me, and she goes, you're welcome. By the way, that has to go back to Blockbuster in two days, so play it as much as you can. They couldn't find the game to purchase, so they rented my gift and, and gift wrap it and gave it to me. I was so sad that I didn't actually own the game when my family was like, yeah, that's got to go back to Blockbuster in two days. And I was like, we, we got to re-rent it then. Like, <laughs> We got to re-rent the damn game because there's no way I'm finishing this game in two days. And they were like, well, we can... Here's what we'll do. We'll return it, and then if they have it for sale, we'll buy it, but it's sold out pretty much everywhere. So that's what I ended up re-renting the game two or three times before we were actually able to purchase it. So uh, yeah, that's that's a holiday, that's a holiday story I can always tell because I know exactly how it happened. I remember it like it was yesterday, and it's also hilarious. So hopefully that was a good one. All right, so the next question I have from the Twitch chat, uh, Mr. Happy, what period in Final Fantasy XV's backstory would you like them to explore more? See, that's really tough because there's 113 kings prior to Noctis. That's a lot of fucking kings. And there's a lot of years in there where things could happen. So the problem is there's so much that could have happened in that time, I can't pick one time that I would like to know more about. Because they could just write into, like write anything into all of that time frame where everything's separated. And I could be like, wow, that happened 500 years ago, a thousand years ago? Wow, that's really cool. You know, like I, I can't label a specific part that is in any way more interesting. If anything, I'd just like to see more of Eos because we only see about a fifth of the entire world in Final Fantasy XV. There are like four more fucking continents out there that we didn't even get to see. And I fully anticipate us getting to see more of them as time goes on with Final Fantasy XV. Here's a nice easy one, Mr. Happy. I've heard you say a few times, but not why. Most team ports you played, but you said stay away from the six. It's because the Final Fantasy VI one looks like shit. <laughs> That's why you stay away from the Steam port of Final Fantasy VI. To be fair, if you've never played Final Fantasy VI, there's no expectation there. 
so you can't really like you might hate the sprites but you don't have the memory of the good sprites of the old shitty but awesome sprites for the original final fantasy 6 or final fantasy 3 depending on how specific you want to be um but if yeah if you've never played it just play the steam version i just don't want to play the steam version because well i know better all right this one's very broad but i think i can answer it is your goal to stream forever first of all that's probably unrealistic because I just, I don't know. To me, that seems unrealistic to have that expectation to stream forever. There needs to be some sort of end goal after that. Mel and I talk about it from time to time, about how we need a, we need an end goal, basically. There needs to be something that it all culminates into. Because streaming is probably not going to be viable forever, or doing it as a source of uh, earning a, excuse me, earning a living may not always be possible. It's, it's, there's, there's too much uncertainty there. So eventually what probably happens is after all this time, I'll probably go back to college. I had one semester left. I have most of my credits to finish my degree, but I finish it for real, something in IT. And then I just take that degree. I have the degree, whatever. And then I probably move into the gaming industry in some means. I have some experience with level design, but I'd probably be more of a, uh, I pro I'd probably work more in QA than anything else uh probably I, I don't know it's just kind of my expectation because level design is not something i don't I, I could i wouldn't have the experience going in that a lot of other people would have so i would need to work probably more probably more on the front end like you know how you you see a lot of uh like community managers and things like that that'd probably be where it would ultimately end up would be on a on a high level community community management sense or a project management sense, but I probably wouldn't ever actually get to work on the games themselves. Uh, it's tough to know where that's gonna go, but to answer the question again, I don't think streaming is a viable thing to do forever. I don't think YouTube videos are gonna be viable to do forever. I would love to do it if it was possible, but look at me, imagine me 20 years from now. Like seriously, did, can you see this streaming 20 years from now? I don't know, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's a, a feasible thing to bank on. You know what I mean? I can't bank on being doing what I'm doing for the next 20 years. There needs, this needs to be some other plan in place. All right, so the next question I have here, other than emotionally, how have you benefited more being on the West Coast, more so than being on the East Coast? I don't think it's specifically West Coast versus East Coast because like, what am I gonna say? West Coast, I get to be with Mel. That's an easy one. Um, I don't, I, I'm away from family, which helps my working situation a little bit. And there's better foods out here. Um, I'd say, I guess the big thing is I'm a lot closer to a lot of companies, so it's not as much travel involved. Like if I want to, you know, take a train up to LA or if I want to take a flight to San Francisco or to Seattle or to Las Vegas or even to Texas, like I'm in SoCal. So getting to places is a lot easier than it may have been for me back on the East Coast. Cause when it's East Coast, you're constantly flying out West and it's a three hour flight, a five hour flight and it's taxing on you now of course yes there are things on the east coast obviously i have to go back out there for KupoCon um at the end of january that's in newark new jersey right where i used to live there's also boston for pax east so it's not everything but like i can do more miscellaneous of things out out west just because i'm closer to where all the gaming companies or most of the gaming companies actually are i'd say that's been a big thing about being on the west coast versus the east coast all right next question now that uh, ff count up cast is over sad face at least for the aspect of 15 have you discussed if you'll be continuing it in some way or form so we're not going to be doing weekly shows for account cast anymore what will probably happen is when dlcs are released for final fantasy 15 uh morag slack and i will come back together to kind of discuss uh, our thoughts on those dlcs how they've improved or changed final fantasy 15 in the long run especially when it comes to i'd like to do with morag and slack when the co-op becomes available i'd like for all three of us to do a co-op day like we did with world of final fantasy like we did with final fantasy 11 i'd like us to do a co-op day in final fantasy 15 if that's possible so those are just a few ideas to throw at you for things you could still expect from the good old count up cast all right, I'm going to take this question. This is a pretty easy question for the last question that I'm going to take here. Uh, are you satisfied with the amount of content in 15? So I'd like to break that question down a little bit. Short answer, yes. I am satisfied that after 120 hours, there are still a handful of things I have left to do, although none of them are particularly exciting now. You know, remaining fishing log, remaining I've, I've, uh, I've come up with a new recipe, you know, the remaining of that. Um, and then on top of that, getting all the items in the game, the Magitek Suit V2, even after six kills now, still eludes me. So fuck that thing, by the way. Um, but for... Hmm... For content itself, 
for launch content. We're not talking about DLC. I know what they have got planned. I know what they're going to do. I've been talking about it for weeks. I'd say I'm content with what was there. But the secret dungeons being all copy pasta was very unsatisfying. And the and the super boss models, like the Adamantos as a super boss, is not interesting. Max Angelus as a super boss is not interesting. And even Nagalfar as a super boss is not that interesting. And Nagalfar is just a bar they just borrowed a model from another enemy that's in the game. They didn't even give him his own unique model. I felt like that was the biggest thing missing for me. Is they set up all these awesome like the first time you run into the Bandersnatch, it's badass. The first time you run into a Naga, it's badass. The first time you run into uh, one of those samurai looking things, it's badass. But then they just keep using them over and over and over. And you just, you're not excited the next time you run into the level 110 samurai versus the level 50 samurai. Who cares? They're the same fucking enemy. There's no difference here. Who cares if this one's 110 and this one's 50? I still know how to beat this enemy. And that was the biggest problem I have with the content. However, that being said, the original eight dungeons, nine dungeons, plus Pityos Ruins are all beautifully designed. Um, the hunts, Outside of only being able to accept one at a time, I love hunts. And also, there are some unique hunt fights, uh, such as the Demon Wall, for example. That was an actually... I, I really like hunts in the style of Demon Wall, and I wish there were more of them. Um, so I wish they had just done more unique content. But I am satisfied with the amount of content and how much time it took me to get through it. Uh, I just wish there was more uniqueness to that actual content. And that's going to be... The last question that I do for today with Mondays with Mr. Happy. Thank you everyone for asking your questions here on the stream. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share with the video. And also my Final Fantasy 15 guides and videos here at the bottom. I've been doing a bunch of them. I do have uh, more bestiaries lined up. I do have more Final Fantasy 14 Let's Plays lined up because I know I took a two week hiatus from those things. I will get back on that for you guys. And remember, just be on the lookout for everything Final Fantasy 15 related. I'm gonna be covering that game for years to come, I feel like. I feel like it's a new Final Fantasy 14 for my channel. And I plan to do a lot, and I mean a lot, of content for it. Anyway, thank you for watching Mondays with Mr. Happy. Be sure to ask your questions on the Dream Network forums for next week. I remembered to put them in the description of the video for last week, and I will remember to do it again this week. Thank you for watching over on YouTube, and until next time, take care.